All right, I'll go ahead and call the uh, stationary source committee meeting to order. And we'll go ahead and get right into item number one. Our update on hexavalent chrome. Susan, go ahead. So uh, this is an update on uh, proposed amendment rule 1469. Um, we've had a very extensive public process on, on this rule. Uh, this is the rule that regulates uh, hexavalent chrome from electroplating and chromic acid anodizing tanks. Um, we have uh, conducted a number of site visits throughout the rulemaking process. Uh, we conduct these site visits to understand the, uh, the intricacies at, at a facility and what might be unique at a facility, also to introduce ourselves and also to hear uh, about any issues that a facility may have in terms of uh, complying with the proposed uh, amended rule. Uh, we want facilities to be able to meet the requirements of our rule, so we want to know about any uh, unique situations. Uh, we did set the hearing in May for a September governing board meeting and uh, our uh, gov uh, public hearing. Uh, at that May uh, hearing, set hearing, uh, the governing board directed staff to continue to work with stakeholders. There are a number of stakeholders that had commented in May in regards to uh, issues they still had in regards to proposed amended rules. That's why we had the uh, very lengthy uh, set hearing. Uh, and so we did continue to work with stakeholders. We have had five briefings to the Station Resource Committee. Uh, we have uh, set hearing twice, and uh, we're hoping this is the one that will stick, and uh, we're hopefully uh, on the glide path for a public hearing in September. So I wanted to highlight the core provisions of Proposed Amendment Rule 1469. Uh, the impetus of this rule uh, was from uh, monitoring efforts that we had done in Paramount and in Newport Beach, uh, Long Beach, uh, also uh, in Compton, where we found uh, very high levels of hexavalent chrome that would uh, come off of uh, tanks that were currently uncontrolled. Um, the tanks that were uh, originally identified were uh, tanks called heated sodium dichromate tanks, which there's 40 of those. They're about 300% above uh, the proposed limit in the rule. Uh, proposed amended rule 1469 will require controls on these tanks as well as other tanks that uh, have high hexavalent chrome emissions that were previously not regulated. The rule also requires that these tanks uh, and other uh, tanks, high emitting chrome tanks, uh, be within a building enclosure. Uh, and uh, also the rule currently, there's only a initial source test. So uh, as we went out in the field, we found that there were some issues with the pollution control equipment. So uh, the rule will require periodic source testing to ensure uh, that the units are, the air pollution control equipment is meeting the emission limits and uh, will require uh, continued compliance with periodic monitoring of uh, the pollution controls, uh, we refer to that as parameter monitoring. So um, we had a February draft, and that's where uh, folks had commented uh, at the May set hearing, and uh, there are still remaining key issues. Uh, we met with uh, the facilities that had provided comments and, and issues in regards to that February proposal. Uh, we made a number of modifications to Proposed Amendment 1469, but we protected the core provisions. So the core provisions are maintained, uh, but we, on the fringe of, of other provisions, we modified those provisions. So this just highlights the, the changes that we made. Uh, the orange triangle represents the current provisions in 1469. Um, this is the February proposal, and this just shows uh, where we've modified uh, Proposed Amendment Rule 1469. So, uh, just as an example, for the building enclosures, there was a requirement that your building enclosure can only have uh, openings that would represent 3% of the building envelope. Uh, the stakeholders requested that it uh, be moved to 3.5%. Uh, we felt that that was reasonable, so it's modified to 3.5%. So this just walks through. Other key provisions of, of Proposed Amendment Rule 1469 in regards to power defense and, and the tank three board ratio. Uh, shows the February proposal, and then this shows uh, where the current uh, proposal in Rule 1469, uh, the current recommendations. Oops. Um, just wanted to remind the Station Resource Committee uh, that uh, the commitments that we made at uh, previous uh, Station Resource Committee meetings in regards to uh, resolution language that we're still committed to incorporate that resolution language in the uh, adoption package, uh, that we would continue to conduct a pilot study and technology assessment looking at alternatives to hexavalent chrome, uh, 
uh, for all applications, that we would support statewide efforts to phase out hexavalent chrome. And um, if, the sort of, if the chemical fume suppressants cannot be recertified, that we would seek funding for these smaller facilities. Um, and as I, uh, the next slide will talk about the socioeconomic impacts. Uh, we did present uh, the socioeconomic impact analysis uh, to our uh, stakeholders this week. Um, this is uh, the document that is uh, required to be provided 30 days before the public hearing, but we are providing it uh, almost a month early uh, to provide the stakeholders to, uh, to, um, to look at the socioeconomic report and also to provide some input. Um, in the socioeconomic report, uh, we do something that's a little bit different in this particular one where we look at the uh, cost of revenue, and that was uh, the primary focus in uh, many of the uh, comments that we did receive. So in terms of the socioeconomic impacts, based on the February proposal that we had and the uh, current proposal, um, it did have a substantial impact on reducing the cost, which was the, one of the primary comments uh, that we had from stakeholders. So. Uh, the February proposal to the current proposal, average annual cost uh, per facility uh, reduces about 45%. And then when we look at the annual jobs foregone, uh, it's a reduction of about 50%. It's not to say that the, the rule doesn't have any cost. The rule, uh, proposed amendment rule, uh, still has cost, but uh, we tried to uh, develop a proposal that was very cost conscious. Um, because we're regulating a number of facilities that would fit the definition of small business. So when we look at the facility impacts of Proposal Amendment Rule 1469, the average annual cost for facilities ranged from 22000 to 36000 This range represents what we uh, created as a, a low and a high scenario uh, cost case, um, looking at a variety of different assumptions uh, for uh, what would uh, potentially occur. Uh, we think the cost would be somewhere in between, in between probably uh, more on the low side. If the chemical fume suppressants are not uh, recertified, then we would see uh, cost probably uh, uh, moving more towards the higher end. Uh, in terms of the job impacts, these are not job losses. These are jobs foregone, uh, meaning that these are jobs that would not be created in the future. Uh, there's approximately 37 to 63 uh, jobs that would be foregone annually. Uh, from implementation of Proposed Amendment Rule 1469. Uh, so next steps is uh, we're moving towards our public hearing in September. And um, any comments, questions? Board members, any comments or questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Please, go ahead. I'm just wondering on the fume suppressants, what's the status on that, the timeline, and what do we do in the meantime, waiting for the certification? So um, our staff has already started to, um, we're, we're getting poised to uh, start the testing. And so uh, the first step is that we conduct the emissions testing from the tanks to understand how much of the fume suppressant actually is escaping from the tank as an emission and uh, source. And then from there, we're going to work with CARB to decide, uh, looking at the health data, the literature on the chemical fumes presence, uh, as well as the emissions data, to decide whether or not we're going to recertify. So the time frame for the facilities to, we would uh, complete our analysis by uh, 2020. They have, uh, I think, till uh, 2021 to put on uh, pollution controls if we decide we're not going to recertify. So in the meantime, until and not until 2021 would they have to use fume suppressants. Exactly. They can use fume suppressants up until uh, the time that they put on the pollution controls because we wouldn't want them not to have anything. Not to have anything. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Sir, can I ask questions? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, are, there any other, are there any other questions? Yes. Go ahead, Joe. Um, it seems to me that, that the monitoring is particularly important when it comes to hexavalent chromium facilities. Uh, you know, what we discovered in Paramount, Rubido, uh, and other places was that when we went out and monitored for hexavalent chromium, all of a sudden we were finding it. So the monitoring requirements and our monitoring efforts seem to be really important to uh, not only assuring compliance, but also identifying new problems that we might not know about. And I'm 
just wondering if you could expand a little bit on what the monitoring requirements in the rule would be and what our commitment is to doing additional uh, monitoring after rule adoption with regard to this. So, um, I'm, um, I think you're referring to the ambient monitoring? You, well, uh, both. Uh, so, whatever is in, in, in the rule for compliance purposes and then whatever we're doing in, in terms of ambient monitoring and continued yeah. community monitoring. Okay, so um, ambient monitoring, so there is monitoring in the rule for source testing on, on the source. So the rule originally, there was only an initial source test, there's now periodic source testing. The requirement now is that they have to periodically source test their uh, tank once every five years if they're under a million amp hours once every seven years. There's also uh, what we refer to as the parameter monitoring, looking at your pressure drop across your HEPA filter. They have to do anemometer, uh, hot wire anemometer monitoring, looking at the slot velocity, and then smoke tests also uh, for more continued compliance uh, that would be occur um, essentially uh, twice a year. But not looking for fugitive emissions. Well, that will look, that will, looking at the slot velocity, it's like what's not reaching and going and being collected to the pollution controls um, is, you know, part of the fugitive. Then you have issues, other issues of fugitives of what settles on a surface and can become airborne. In terms of ambient monitoring and fence line monitoring, that's not included in proposed amendment rule 1469, but we are working on proposed rule 1480, which will have ambient monitoring and will be more comprehensive than just looking at uh, chrome plating and anodizing facilities, but a variety of toxic facilities and a variety of uh, particulate uh, toxic air contaminants. Um, and just not necessarily is this rule specific, but I, I know that we've committed to continue to do monitoring in Paramount. We're continuing to do monitoring in Long Beach. We're doing MATES 5 right now. Uh, is, is there a commitment by staff to 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 go to some of these other communities that, that tend to have chrome plating and other metal processing facilities that may emit chrome. I mean, I, I looked at a map last night that, you know, of just mapping out the facilities that said there were chrome emissions. And I mean, there were Burbank, Wilmington, Carson, West, uh, Long Beach, uh, South Central, Los Angeles, Santa Fe Springs, um, all these places, some of which are AB 7, uh, 617, East LA, Vernon. Uh, six, uh, our AB 617 priority locations for us. I was just wondering, are we going to continue to, to do that uh, monitoring like we have done Paramount and now Compton? So part of that will be done through the AB 617 process, mm -hmm. and part of these rules will hopefully eliminate the need for that, but it's always been our intention to continue to look at monitoring within certain areas, looking at the type of industry that's located there, and then move monitors there accordingly. But we're hopeful that with the new rules passing, that we, it won't be a very long-term investment, that we won't have the years in and all of those other aspects that we found early on with Paramount, Compton, and others. But we do intend to go forward, whether it's through 617, whether it's through our own independent process, or whether it's through some other factor that uh, causes us to be there. That's our intention. Okay. That's, that's uh, assuring, and I look forward to 1482, which will help address this. Uh, in terms of the monitoring component of it. On the enforcement part, you now there's a provision on the total enclosure stuff about how, uh, with the doors, where the doors can be open and for how long, right? There's a two hour two a day limit, right. is that what it is? Um, and, you know, in, in terms of enforcement, are the requirements kind of useless if we can't enforce it? How do you enforce a two hour a day limit on how long you keep the door open? So, so, so I have teenagers. I'd like to know for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that that was a question that came up in the working group meeting. Would we have you know some type of uh, you know like something that would have to you know measure like how long a door is open? Uh, the answer was no, but uh, it gives our um, compliance staff the ability that if they're out there and they're uh, in, doing an inspection, they start at twelve and it ends at three, and the, the same door was uh, open that allow the cross trap and you know we could cite the facility. Also it's like if we're uh, working with a facility and we're you know hearing issues about it, we're hearing monitor and we, we start to uh, monitor more closely on the activity at the facility, uh, it gives us then uh, the ability to um, enforce on that. Uh, this was a provision that I, I think someone from Stationary Source had 
uh, suggested that we have some type of, of limit on the uh, door opening. And so we, we added the two hours in there. Um, it is a difficult, you know, I don't think we want to really put a monitor on the door of, you know, how long the door is open, but it does give us that, that ability. And then it, it does require the facility to, um, they should be adhering to that provision whether we're, we're there or we're not there. So. Okay, and then finally, uh, it wasn't clear from the presentation what, if any, changes have been made since the set hearing. So there were changes right there yeah. made Some since that changed. hearing. Yeah. Um, so where she had the blue lines. But that, that those were like February. That that was the set hearing. That I thought well, the set hearing was what happened hearing. was that the set hearing package was pulled uh, because we uh, the set hearing packages were we referred to. We had a lot of these to, folks complaining. Yeah, I yeah, remember. It was referred to as the thirty day package, and the thirty days. Uh, occurred after the hearing was set. Okay, so that's those sl two slides where you have the February date. Oh, that's actually the that changes was, that have happened since the set hearing. Right, because that, that was the that was last public proposal uh, that was out, and that's the proposal that uh, they were commenting on. Okay. And it was the core ones where you showed the uh, ring on the outside. Those are the changes. Yeah, all the changes on the the ring on the outside, and then highlighted. You know, we didn't slide all the way back to. Uh, you know, the very beginning of no controls, uh, we tried to balance what we needed to do in terms of public health protection and also acknowledging the need for the stakeholders and compliance. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair? Ms. Louise, please go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah I, I had a couple of questions. I know we had a long, lengthy discussion at our last hearing from the community regarding uh, the concern around schools. And I know this rule may not address that, but where can you go over that again? Because I know that was very, very critical to our to our communities that came forward and spoke on this issue. And then number two, wanted to also know if there is a possibility at all to between now and maybe September do do another round of uh, community hearings because my staff tells me they went out to area in my district, South El Monte on Rush Street, where we have a number of these facilities there that are very, very uh, densely, popu densely populated area. And even around El Sereno on Alhambra Road, which is northeast uh, area of Los Angeles, but it, it, it is part of the city of LA. So I really do think we have to do a better job in, in informing our communities about what this impact is and what this rule will mean to them. So those are two questions. Okay, so um, your first question in regards to schools. So we did add a provision in, in Proposal Mineral 1469 that requires any facility that's within a thousand feet of a school uh, to close that side of the building so that they couldn't have openings on that side of the building. Um, the definition of school has been modified. It was uh, before uh, that it was a thousand feet from a school or early education facility. Um, we modified the definition of school to collapse school to incorporate the early education. Um, I think as we move forward in all of our toxic schools, when we talk about school, it'll now reference this new definition of school and early education centers. So. Um, it's a more encompassing definition of school, um, but in terms of the material difference in Proposal Amendment 1469, we were saying school and early education facility. Uh, this was at the request of one of the stakeholders to collapse the definition. Okay. Potential for another hearing or information? Sure. I mean, we can conduct a, another um, kind of a public consultation meeting in the community. Um, and talk about proposed amendment rule 1469. Um, so uh, I would appreciate it. And it makes it nervous. Thank you. <laughs> well, <I don't... laughs> We're doing public hearing. Yeah, we have a public hearing. September. It's uh, set for September or August. Well, we're dark. We already set. September. September. Yeah. September. Will you have staff? The staff available to do something because I mean we can try to yeah, arrange something. <laughs> they still work in August. Yeah, we still. Yeah, yeah they're that's right. <laughs> this is really important. Yeah, I, I'm not okay. going anywhere in August. Well, Everyone in August. else goes someplace, but yeah. Susan stays here. Yeah. So. <laughs> I live here. Yeah. 
So is that a yes? Yes. yes. Definitely. <laughs> okay, good. And then just the last question, again, just going back to small businesses, uh, those smaller facilities that uh, obviously can't meet these requirements, trying to uh, provide incentives for them to transition out or to assist them in some way. So any, any further thoughts on that? Yeah, this is, uh, this has been something I think that has been just really nagging at me. Um, so um, our costs, we did a, is a cost of revenue analysis and the overall cost of revenue on average we see from implementation of the proposed amended rule is 1.8 to 3.3 percent. But when we look at the, um, those small decorative chrome plating facilities that might need to put on the pollution controls, uh, the average uh, cost of revenue can go up to as high as 7.8 percent. Um, so we know that for those smaller facilities that um, mm -hmm. we have greater concern. And so when we are committed to doing uh, the seeking funding, but the funding would offset the cost on the capital. Uh, the, the larger concern for me is on the operation and maintenance, uh, which can be, um, our estimates are about 18% of the capital. Uh, capital is about $100,000 uh, per unit. Um, so for these facilities, the O&M could be fairly substantial. Um, those estimates are conservative estimates. The, the actual O&M may, may be less. Uh, I have been in communication with the California Air Resources Board of uh, some sort of alternative approaches that we might be able to, to look at. So I think it, if it means that we reopen the rule, um, then I think that at that point we may need to do that to talk about maybe a sort of certification process for uh, pollution control uh, package uh, for these small uh, deck facilities. But um, these, these are just sort of initial thoughts. It's like we haven't been mm -hmm. in it. Uh, we really want to get the rule to the board to get the pollution controls on these other tanks, uh, but recognizing that we have another issue looming in regards to these small decorative yep. facilities. Supervisor, right. I okay. can add, AB 617 uh, contemplates uh, dealing with toxics in these kind of communities, and it also provides uh, funding, if you will. So this year, under the governor's budget, instead of $250 million, there's $245 million that will be available to provide incentives to reduce uh, emissions and uh, risk within these local communities. The first year that this was enacted, it was $250 million, and those funds could only be expended through Calmore and Pop 1D. The most recent budget allows now for the use of the $245 million, the second year of funding, on both mobile and stationary sources. And the intent is to use it particularly on those type of small businesses. So there is funding Good. that we're looking for. And as Susan has said, there's additional funding that we'll have to look for for ongoing issues. But I just wanted you to be aware that you know, we're certainly considering these. We're working with the legislature to obtain that funding and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, unless there's any other questions, I can see we have some public commenters ready. Uh, Wayne, how many public comment cards do we have, or is there a, a large group, or is this a, more of a normal sized group today? We have about a dozen or so, yes. roughly. Okay, so, so we're going to probably limit public comment then to about two minutes. So if we can go ahead and, and if, if someone in the room has a timer that can do that, it'd probably be a little bit easier than me trying to come back through the VT. I don't know if our staff has a timer we could use there. Uh, we do. The we Apple do. timer. Okay. We, we all. Come on. I guess, uh, come on down. Wes, come up first. Wes Turnbow. Yeah, good morning, uh, board members, staff. Um, I want to start by saying I'm Wesley Turnbow with the Metal Finishing Associations of California. And I want to start with first and foremost, uh, we have come to a compromise language on Rule 1469. It's taken a lot of effort and, and a lot of work, and, and we appreciate what the, each one of you has done to help that come about. Uh, so thank you. Uh, there are two things now that kind of come out, and, I, and they're both significant. You guys are already touching on them. The social economic analysis came out um, last week, almost exactly a week ago. And out of that, we've got a couple of uh, issues. One is we'd like it to be right, and I know you would like it to be right. 
Uh, and, and a lot of those numbers we agreed on through the process, but there's a lot missing, we think. There's a lot that needs to be honed and edited. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is let's take the time to get that right so everyone understands what's at stake, what jobs are at stake, what, uh, what industry costs are at stake. The second, and this is what you guys have uh, been talking about and discussing already, is this is significant. And by what we think are already kind of low numbers, 7.5% of revenues for these smaller shops, 27 decorative shops, jobs and shops are going out of business, and they're going to go out of business fast. We've got to figure out a way, and it's got to be really concrete, it's imperative, it's got to be concrete of how these, how these shops are going to survive. What are we going to do if we're talking about money, if we're talking about certifying the people, so let's get that stuff done, let's figure out how that, where that money's going to come from, let's not just say, well, we'll figure out that there'll be some money and we'll make sure they survive, because that scares me, that when this is all done, it won't happen, and that'll be the end of a lot of jobs. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thanks, guys. <coughs> Brian Liker, I'm, I'm the executive director of the Metal Finishing Association of California. Um, I just want to reiterate on what Mr. Turnbow just said. Yes, this this rule, um, first of all, we do appreciate working with staff, and they have conceded many issues to us, and it's been a good working relationship over the past uh, 13 working group meetings. But this rule has a strong impact on our industry. Uh, since 2009, we've lost 24 members who have gone out of business. Uh, Asking a company to come up with up to 7 or 8% of revenues to pay for these measures is, is going to basically put them underwater right away. This is a very competitive industry. There's not huge profits in this industry. These are family-owned businesses that employ you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 people. Uh, these are career-long jobs. Uh, this will have a devastating impact on our business industry. I think it will put 30 to 40% of companies out of business. Um, also, the capital costs up, up front, trying to put these measures in, this money is going to have to come up, come from the beginning. It's not going to be something that's going to be stretched over time. Companies that can't get bank loans or don't have the funds or don't have the profit margin to come up with this and want to comply, they're going to be forced with a tough decision whether to close down or move out of state or there's not a lot of options for them. The other thing is competition. It's going to be hard for companies to compete with companies that are outside the region, whether they're in Ventura County or San Diego or Mexico, how are they going to compete with these companies that weren't, are not going to be faced with these measures right now? The time frame to comply is, a, is, is an important issue. Um, in closing, I'd like to, well, this is a handout of our concerns since, you know, a time, time frame. In closing, I'd like to just bring up one point um, and ask everybody to please look at the monitoring results from 4th of July when all the companies were closed. Um, it shows the, some of the highest level readings we've ever seen. Um, keep in mind how many fireworks shows there are during the summer. Is there monitors near Disneyland, near the schools, near the residential areas in Disneyland where there's, monitor, there's fireworks going off every night? I'd urge you to look at those numbers, too. Thank you. Hi. Florence Caribbean with the Del Amo Action Committee. Very happy to be here today. Interesting to me that Supervisor Solis's questions were somewhat similar to my own, with my ask for my presentation to be that the district work with the community, acknowledging the essential role the community members and representatives of the community played in bringing this serious public health threat in paramount to the forefront. Also to suggest that Hex Chrome facility operators understand how their facilities operate. The Air District staff that made 56 visits to the facilities and have gained a greater understanding through their work have a better knowledge of that. But these issues are very difficult for community members to understand. The bottom line for the community is that no Hex Chrome releases occur and that a vigilant air Q, AQMD monitoring be done to ensure the releases are stopped and not reoccurring. I highly recommend that the district meet with concerned community members and organizations before the September 18th public hearing. Um, I have more to say, but I will close by mentioning that we all remember Erin Brockovich and the movie and the work that she did in Hinckley, California. Just to let you know, the groundwater contamination from hex chrome in that community did not stop. It is still there. It is still moving. And community members that did not sue in the original lawsuit have filed a suit now. 
So these problems have long-term consequences that we may or may not completely understand. I also want to mention that in the comments that were received before, there were two major topics. One of them was the chemical fume suppressants, and the other one was the requirement for ambient air monitoring, which is a critical piece to making sure this program works. Thank you very much. Next. Good morning, Kurt Coleman on behalf of Southern California Air Quality Alliance. And um, Boeing is one of our members, and uh, Bill Pierce has appeared before you before to uh, address this issue, and he's been uh, mainly carrying the ball for us on this rule. He couldn't be here today and asked me to make a few comments. Um, be very brief. Um, he would ask me to make sure to thank Susan and her staff for um, considering and addressing the concerns that uh, Boeing had uh, raised. And um, uh, we think the staff has done an outstanding job at trying to resolve all of the issues and that have been raised by all the, the stakeholders in this uh, rulemaking. Thank you. So anyone would like to speak to 1469? Good morning. I'm Sam Bell with Metal Surfaces Incorporated. A couple of comments. One is, in the rule, um, many of our platers are job tasks are doing work for our customers that are moments notice type work, and, and we're just asking that a de minimis size or de minimis usage of a of a hexavalent chrome tank um, be included in the rule to where it may require just um, time of use or or um, at, at minutes that are used like half an hour a week because we're just doing work that's whatever our customer demands and we don't have production in these areas. So we'd like to see some provision for de minimis in there. The other thing is that the core of any good rule is the numbers, the, the actual um, toxicity of the material that we're dealing with. And, and as I understand that Coachella Valley um, has sued the state because of, because of the um, ambiguity of the numbers or the changing of the numbers and also the cost impact to do water prone six monitoring and that, and that they actually had mm. a judge rule to postpone their rulemaking for two years, well, I don't know if it was OHIHA is going to go back and look at it, but the core of any good rule is good data to start with. And, and our feeling is, is that the initial data, even though this is a performance rule and the numbers really don't count, it's going to count when it comes to the air monitoring to the next rules coming down the line, um, and that we request that OHIHA come back and, and there's a request for OHIHA to come back and relook at those numbers. Now, we initially talked to them as an association, and they said it would be like two years before they could even get to that. Well, it sounds like Coachella Valley is going through that same thing, and, and they're going to get to two years. This rule was originally to be promulgated last, uh, last, last December, and uh, we're going ahead and asking OHIHA to get forward. Thank you. <coughs> Any other speakers? One more, at least. Hello, I'm, I'm Alan Olick. I'm president of General Plating, Bright Plating, and a member of the NFASC for about 25 years. <coughs> I've been an employer and an employee. I was an employee of 1928 Jewelry, which had 1,200 employees. They're down to 30. I was an employee of Price Pister Water Faucet, Coima. I built their facility in Mexico, their prototype facility. Worked there for five years. Price Pister had 1,200 employees. My company has between 80 and 125 employees. It's 1928, almost extinct. 
Prime Minister Water Fawcett left. Crown City Plating, the largest plating company west of Mississippi, is gone. Temple City, 1,200 employees. Um, most recently, Steve's Plating in Burbank, who they're coined and noted for inventing the pool ladder for swimming pools in Southern California. They started in 1951. They uh, had between 10 employees and 150 employees. They're closing in August. <coughs> Our industry, all industry, is leaving California. My industry and my company is fighting to stay in California. We have a chrome plating tank, and an outside person looking at our company, well, you're a chrome plater, you're polluting. We're using our chrome plating tank, it tops six minutes an hour. Six minutes <coughs> an hour, way, way below its capacity. And we're asked to regulate it, and we're asked to, which we do. We were asked to put fume suppressants in, which we did. We were asked to monitor, which we did. Then we did source test. We did five source tests at my company. They were expensive. The uh, AQMD thinks source tests are between $14,000 and $17,000. When you're running a business, the cost of the source test, you got to shut the system down. Employees aren't paying for employees not working, not producing a product. You have the source testing people. AQMD requires a permit to do the source testing, about $4,500. Pay them, pay them. By the time you finish, the $14,000 source test is now twenty-five dollars or $30,000. Now, I'm asked to, I'm up, can I have double time? <laughs> Please? Sorry. I'm a taxpayer. We all are, but everybody else. Let me go real quick and closing. Uh, thank Cl you. Closing? We want to stay in business. We want to employ people. We want to be good citizens. We don't want to pollute. I'm not a polluter, and I haven't killed anybody yet that I know of. But it's, getting, it's getting close. Thank you for your comments. Hi, good morning. It's Rabina Sewell from California Safe Schools. And I want to thank staff for taking the time to talk with us and other school stakeholders in ensuring that the most vulnerable populations of children in schools, thank you, Supervisor Solis, uh, for your decades of concern uh, about children and schools. And I'm very um, appreciative of, of the time that was taken to work on that. There is one question, though. Um, at the very end of the definition, it says, the term includes any building or structure, playground, athletic field, or other area of school property, and this next session is the uh, part, um, but does not include unimproved school property. So there were some questions that I received this morning prior to coming to this meeting about what that meant exactly, because there are areas of schools or properties adjacent to them that might be used for picnics, for carnivals, for art projects, for science fairs. And so if we could get more of a clarification on that. And then I'm really hopeful, and, and I think Susan said this earlier, uh, was that there will be a consistent definition of school. So as we go through each uh, rule, it doesn't have to keep coming up again and again. And then finally, um, I hope that there can be more outreach to the community so that they better understand these issues and um, revisit again the monitoring and because the enforcement of these rules are going to be very uh, challenging especially for sensitive receptors and communities without that thank you very much Hi, good morning. I'm Bill Lamar, Executive Director of the California Small Business Alliance. We also represent a vulnerable population, small businesses. The industry's worked hard and made difficult compromises to change the rule to what it is today, somewhat acceptable to the larger shops and a death knell to smaller ones, and certainly an unemployment for their workers. Hundreds, maybe thousands of employees will be jobless. Their families will, not ha will no longer have a steady source of income, nor will they have health insurance. Some could lose their homes. Kids going to college may have to defer uh, their plans um, until mom or dad uh, get another job as good as the one that this agency 
could deny them uh, unless we could resolve some key issues. At the last working group meeting, staff is, wasn't receptive to extending the time beyond September to continue working with industry to resolve lingering disparities in the rule and to begin earnest discussions to address the inconsistencies between their cost assessment and industry's numbers. I'd like to remind you that a part of the review of the district's socioeconomic analysis by APT Associates was a summary of recommendations wherein they noted the inadequacies of the REMI model in analyzing the real financial impacts of rulemaking for small businesses. This was corroborated in a follow-up study, which I believe was done by IEC Associates uh, in one of their reports uh, that concurred that small businesses are disproportionately and adversely impacted by government rulemaking. The bottom line is staff should be less concerned with meeting some arbitrary deadline to bring any rule in at any cost to industry, to the governing board, uh, to the governing board for their approval. Uh, about 40 years ago, Orson Welles, so some of you may remember him, in one of his commercials for Paul Masson Wines, he used to say, we will set time before it's time. There should be no rule making before it's time. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other speakers? On down. Two more at least, Mayor. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Charles Bell, Metal Services. To uh, repeat, Bill, I think that to conclude this process with a meeting in September is premature. I'm not an economist, but as I understand the analysis, there's basically a, a, an estimate of uh, cost of the various shops included within the purview of this rule to uh, uh, meet the upfront capital cost and the, uh, I believe incorporated in that also will be the ongoing O&M costs. Uh, my concern is if I just look at it from a bank point of view, if it's if if that a uh, uh, period is spread over a 15-year period, I don't think anybody can go to the bank. If I'm going to have to come up with a hundred thousand or half a million or a million, go to the bank and get a 15-year bank loan. I don't think I can do that. Some shorter period would be required. And uh, again, I'm not an economist, but I think if you shorten it up to five years or some other length of time, you'd have, we'd have a more accurate number of, of what the financial impact is really going to be on industry. <clears throat> we received the district's uh, socioeconomic last week. If a rule is coming, and I suspect the rule is coming, it ought to be based on accurate financial information and I think there ought to be a 30 or 60 day continuance minimum on this process so that the various shops and that MFASC can take a formal look at the socioeconomic comment on it. And at least we'd have uh, 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 what we consider to be accurate information. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Felipe Aguirre and I live and work in the city of Maywood. You know, I'm hearing this discussion I have heard for several months where we're, we're trying to look at the question of keeping jobs, keeping jobs. How about keeping people's health? How about keeping people alive? We have four platers that are within a thousand feet, you know, of elementary schools. We have a chrome plater in Maywood right across the street from an elementary school. Is this rule going to change it? Are we going to have something to uh, protect those children and the parents that walk those children to the school? Is this rule going to affect that or not? That's all. Thank you. Is there anybody else after this gentleman? One more. Thank you. Two yeah, my name is Vince Grana. I work at California Electroplating and I'm a member of the Metal Finishers Association since probably the beginning. And I uh, uh, feel like it's important to come up with a happy medium, um, whatever that might be. 
uh, livable situation for us and for this, the uh, organization. And um, my family bought into the company in 1962. My dad and uncle were in into plating in the 50s, and uh, we bought in in 1962. We've been running it since. Uh, it's a good, good business. Um, very important business for a lot of people. We're a job shop. We have 25 employees, basically. Um, small, small business shop. We don't do a lot of uh, aerospace work. It's all commercial, very competitive work. If um, we, we're already highly regulated, highly, highly regulated. So um, trying to put on something that's not realistic is, is just very worrying to us. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is Ed Appleton. I'm with Metal Finishing Marketers. Uh, I'm a third generation metal finisher uh, with roots going back to 1932 with my grandfather. Um, I've been in the industry for about 40, 40 43 years now. Um, seen a lot of changes take place in California. I'm a native Californian. Um, seen a lot of benefits take place through uh, the efforts of air quality control. I remember back in the 70s of my lungs burning as I would uh, be at school, you know, from the smog and everything, and, and uh, just the uh, effect, uh, the things that have taken place to improve those things. It's tremendous in the work that has been done. Um, over the period of time, I've seen a lot of changes in all the environmental issues as we try to improve our environment. Um, this is one time that I <clears throat> truly fear the exist, existence, continued existence of our company um, with, with what's going to be imposed upon us. Um, my main concern is things that are out of our control. Um, just for an example, you know, we're required to do various things and stormwater is one of them. And uh, we've, we've always been out of compliance with stormwater, no matter what we would do, what, matter, what efforts we would make. We don't have control of what takes place in our environment. And, uh, and uh, so we've had to become non-exposure in that area to, to comply in that area. And, um, but my concern with this ruling and everything is that there could be things taking place that is totally out of our control that we're going to be looked upon as being responsible for and make recommendations for and have to prove that it's not us, which is going to be very costly and expensive. And... Uh, I appreciate the, the staff and, and what they've been doing. I appreciate the Metal Finishing Association um, on what they've been working with. But I know it's a very ba a fine balance that you guys have to work with with the community. Uh, we want to be uh, aware of uh, our, our children and everything else. So uh, we need to find balance in what we're doing here. Thank and you. thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Jane Williams. I'm the Executive Director of California Communities Against Toxics. So thank you for the opportunity here to um, discuss this, one of my favorite rules again. Um, I have enough of these. These are our October letter from last year. This rule does not address any of the substantive concerns that we've laid out consistently in this rulemaking process after 32 work group meetings. Um, you can pass those around. This is the petition for the country of Sweden to ban one of the perfluorinated compounds that this agency that will be voting on to use in these um, chrome plating operations. This is a chemical that is so toxic, it is proposed to be banned internationally through an international treaty, and we're going to allow it to be used here all over Southern California in highly, highly, highly vulnerable communities. It's just a serious public policy um, problem. On Friday, finally, we were able to list 
PFOS and PSFOA, which were some of the other perfluorinated compounds that used to be used. Um, the limits are um, 13 and 14 parts per trillion. And I'll just hold up this chart. You see the numbers that are all the way to the left over here? These are some of the most toxic compounds that we are regulating in groundwater. These are more toxic than PCBs and more toxic than hexavalent chromium. Let me just give you a quick list of the communities that are hosting some of these facilities. Los Angeles, Compton, El Segundo, Los Angeles. Sun Valley, Monrovia, Los Angeles, Burbank, Los Angeles, El Monte, Monrovia, Inglewood, Monrovia, Inglewood, Monrovia. Those are all chrome platers that are within 1,000 feet of schools. Most of these are elementary schools. Pardon? So this is a very, very, very toxic set of toxic chemicals. The fume suppressants and the hex chrome, and we're going to allow them to leave the doors open. I just don't think we're getting at the risk here. So um, we look forward to the set hearing and look forward to trying to work with the agency as we continue on down this path. But it's very, very disappointing to put this much time and effort into this rulemaking and really not have it be protective. Thank you. Sounds like more. Any other comments? Wait once, twice. Wait one more. Wait one more. <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm <clears throat> Patrick King with uh, Morales Electroplating, and I'd just like to again thank Susan for and the staff for the hard work they've done on this uh, rule. Um, I think at this point the, the the industry is really looking at the economics of this, and that's the main issue that we're concerned about. And having just gotten um, the information last week, uh, we start seeing things, especially if if uh, fume suppressants are taken out of the picture, it's really putting a burden on those small companies that are uh, relying on using them now uh, to avoid more expensive measures. And I also, looking at the, at the economics, uh, you know, your, your percent of your revenue obviously is based on your revenue. Some of the numbers we saw in there were significantly, significantly lower costs and significantly higher revenue than, than we feel is um, accurate. So again, it's it's not a matter of, I mean, we're very happy with the cooperation that the industry has gotten so far in developing this rule, but I think we need to uh, take the time to look at the economics and make sure we understand it. Thank you. Thank you. One more, one more there. All right, this is the last one. Last, last, last one, and it won't be two minutes. Um, Dan Zimmon from Metal Finishing Association, thank you for the time and working uh, with us. I uh, just want to uh, reinforce that we, as part of the metal finishing community, are very concerned about our employees, our neighbors, our environment. We um, work every day with these materials, and we don't want to subject um, any of us, any of you, or anybody to um, unnecessary um, things that will come of harm. So. Um, in working with uh, staff, working with in the community, uh, our, our concern is both health, safety, um, our customers as well, especially the aerospace and the economic impact. So um, just want to kind of reinforce that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other board member comments on this item? Yes. Uh, maybe perhaps before the board member comments, staff would like to uh, address some of the issues that were raised for the board member consideration. Please. Thank you. So with that, Susan. So I'll, I'll try to uh, go quickly. Um, so there was a comment in regards to having a de minimis level for low-use tanks. Um, our rule is not uh, done just for local, but we're also implementing the state HCM and the federal, uh, which is called the federal NESHAP. Um, there is no de minimis for, for low-use tanks in the ATCM or the federal NESHAP, so we would be, uh, we, our agency would not be in compliance with those uh, regulations if we were to have a de minimis level. Um, there are provisions in 1469 that 
uh, acknowledge uh, low use tanks in terms of lower amp hours and, and uh, requirements that uh, lesser requirements for those facilities, uh, we, uh, which will go into the source testing. Um, we have modified the source testing provision. It started out as once every two years that a facility would have to source test. We modified it to once every three years. And then based on comments, in fact, by Cal Electro Plating asking for a provision that would be less frequent and something that would acknowledge low, lower amp hour uh, tanks uh, and facilities that we went to once every five years. And if you have amp hours less than a million amp hours per year uh, permitted, that you would go to once every seven years. So we feel like we've met the industry more than halfway on, on the source testing frequency. Uh, the comment made in regards to a delay in rulemaking because hexavalent chrome and, and drinking water, um, it was, we did go and we, we looked that up. It was uh, with the state water board. The issue wasn't on the science of hexavalent chrome and uh, the toxicity of hexavalent chrome, but was the lack of an economic analysis that was part of that regulation. And so there was a delay to ask them to uh, do that economic analysis uh, for that regulation. Um, in regards to the comment for uh, the definition of school, uh, that it uh, doesn't include unimproved property, that is the existing wording that was in the definition of school in 1469, uh, which is also implementing the state ATCM. Um, we're uh, a little bit, uh, I guess it could make it more stringent, and we were concerned about uh, any noticing issues that we might have if we were to... Um, overly modify the definition of school and what that might mean in terms of the existing provision for school. So uh, we'd have to go to, to look at that to see what the impact could be. Um, in regards to the issue um, in terms of accurate costs, um, through the entire rulemaking process, we, the Metal Finishing Association had hired uh, an economist to sessions. Uh, we worked with two sessions to share uh, all of the base cost assumptions. Uh, we're generally in agreement with the base cost assumptions. Um, what we did was we looked at each facility and what the cost would be based on their current configuration of their facility, the tanks that they have. Um, the economists for the Metal Fishing Association looked at 10 facilities, extrapolated the cost for those 10 facilities to the whole entire universe. Um, they've requested that we share uh, all of our detailed cost information with them. Uh, we're putting that all together. We just need to hide any proprietary information. So we're going to just protect the facilities by their, um, hiding their names, and we're willing to provide that. Um, on the other side, we have asked for their uh, list of 10 facilities so we can confirm it. Uh, we never did receive that. Uh, on the issue of, of PFAS, um, and uh, the rule has a commitment uh, to evaluate PFOS, to relook at these chemical fume suppressants, and if we cannot recertify them, that we would uh, require those facilities to put on pollution controls. This is where the highest cost would come from uh, in terms of when you look at cost of revenue. Could you just clarify the intent of PFOS in relation to x -Rum? So um, the PFOS is using the chemical fume suppressants, and uh, it is used to, it gets, you know, over a 90% reduction in the, in the tanks. It's only allowed for the smallest facilities. Um, hexavalent chrome is a toxic air contaminant that's a known human carcinogen that ha is one of the highest potencies when you look at the lifetime uh, impact of it as a chronic uh, carcinogen. And uh, PFOS, uh, PFOA, um, PFAS, uh, there's concerns because they're bioaccumulative. Um, so there's, you know, differences in terms of uh, how you would look at that. Uh, much of the information that OEHA had in looking at the literature of the uh, chemical fume suppressants and the uh, PFAS components that are in there, there was lack of a lot of health information on that. Uh, but we do understand the concern in regards to the toxicity uh, of those constituents in those formulations. Um, I think there was one other... Susan, can I just add to the PFAS issue? Uh, when um, Ms. William mentioned that, that uh, we will allow the use of these PFAS alternatives, that is the situation today. There's nothing banning that today. Not going forward with the rule would still allow those to be used. And actually, to the contrary, what the rule does is actually phase them out over the next couple years unless they can be shown to be safe in this application. Yeah, and... and uh, it wouldn't be prudent for us to say, okay, uh, the chemical fumes presence we're concerned, we're going to ban it right now. 
uh, because then these tanks would be completely uncontrolled. Uh, they need, they would need time. First, we would, I think we need to do this analysis to determine whether or not we can or cannot recertify them. And then the facilities need time to put on pollution controls. Um, we would not want them to be uncontrolled completely. Um, without the chemical fume suppressants, they would need to put on some type of anti pollution control. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Do my board members have any follow-up comments? Mr. Chairman, I, I have one. Um, Please. We, we heard a number of people ask for more time since they just got the socioeconomic analysis recently. Um, could you comment on that? So um, the typically the socioeconomic analysis would be released 30 days before the public hearing. So we released the socioeconomic analysis last Friday, so almost a month. Uh, ahead of when we would typically uh, provide that. Um, I understand that they, they feel that they, they want more time, they want to you know work out the issues. Um, we feel that the rule is ready uh, for the governing board to make a decision. And uh, we feel that the socioeconomic analysis is like there, we may get comments and there may be some you know modifications for uh, the document that goes for 30 days before the public hearing, but uh, staff feels confident that we're ready. Uh, we think it's now really should go into the hands of the governing <coughs> board to decide uh, how we want to move forward uh, with the proposed amendment. Uh, just want to remind the uh, committee that uh, by not moving and by delaying, we have delayed when I had that long chart multiple times. We're delaying the installation of pollution controls uh, for these facilities that have the high chrome emitting tanks and requiring the provisions for the enclosures, uh, requiring the setting the clock to start your periodic source testing, we really want to move forward with the public health protection aspect of the rule. And one more question. Um, with respect to the small businesses, who are the ones that are going to be the most impacted because of the um, costs, um, have, have you considered uh, a phase-in period for them that gives them longer time to, to, I think you did say the source testing that does, you know, stretch out if they're a smaller operation. So most of these costs for these smaller facilities is if we decide that we cannot certify the chemical fume suppressants and they need to put on pollution control. So I think if we get to that point, we will, we've already committed to seeking funding but already the wheels are turning in, in terms of what other creative approaches that we can look at. I've been in communication with CARB. Uh, they're starting to work on their ATCM in terms of, you know, could we do, uh, instead of, you know, certifying a fume suppressant and relieving them from source testing that, maybe they, there would be a package control, uh, you know, yeah. So it, it, we're looking and thinking about what we can do for those smaller facilities. I think it's important to recognize that there is time currently allotted within post framework of three years. And as Susan said earlier, that if we need to address that during that time period, that's something that we can certainly come back and reopen. But during that period, we're also looking at acquiring additional funding to help offset some of those. So we do have some time to move forward. We do have time for the board to make its decision with regards to the completeness of the pack that the staff is submitting and to determine if there's any additional requirements or necessary information in moving forward. If I can add, and doing nothing on those small facilities can put them in, in an even more awkward position. Mm -hmm. If these non PFAS fume suppressants that are getting a lot of attention do prove to be a public health problem, then there, there are no, the only alternative is still putting on control. So we need to start the process, get uh, our work done. I don't done. think so. Uh, Mr. No. Chair, the, I mean, the one thing I'm not hearing here is, is the efforts that we've committed to to help people consider alternatives to hexagon chrome. As that, that's part of the right. I mean, if, if we can get these facilities to use something other than hexavalent chromium, they don't have a PFOS people a problem anymore. Or hexavalent chrome. But that also gets to the timing issue. And staff has actually met with DOD as suggested by this committee. And DOD is actually moving forward, but it's going to take time. That doesn't mean that we're not working any less toward achieving that. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we're not looking at other alternatives. It's just a recognition of the timing aspects and whether or not we're going to Well, I mean, you, you, there was no mention 
Agreed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We mentioned it in terms of the commitment. No, no other no, option. No. We, I think the, there is. Yeah. In the board commitment resolution, it, it was highlighted that, that we're committed to that tech assessment. Um, and we have... And securing funding. Right. Yes. But the tech assessment to phase out hexavalent chromium and to, to look. And we have interviewed and talked to the facilities that have gone to trivalent. Um, it is not an easy um, shift for a facility, and uh, what we're finding is that even facilities that have gone to trivalent, they, some of them still have <coughs> some aspect of hexavalent and chrome plating uh, that they'll either you know, send out or that they, it doesn't meet all of their needs all the time. So uh, there's still work that needs to be done uh, in there, and we're committed to doing that. It's in the adoption, it'll be in the adoption resolution, so. And that was my point, if we do nothing, and we don't do that work to transition to try, or don't do the work to find the fume suppressants, or don't do the work to find the funding for potential controls, then those facilities may be in an even more awkward position coming up. Mr. Chair? Supervisor? Yeah, just going back to the definition of uh, schools, early childhood, I, I don't feel that that's very clear. We heard some testimony there regarding uh, other properties adjacent to school or a part of a school site. And I'm particularly concerned because where you have schools, you typically have maybe within a thousand feet or depends, a park. You got a lot of children that go to these parks as well. So I really think we ought to be thinking about how we define this and um, want to hear a little bit about that. So, so there's, um two main definitions. Uh, we collapse early education with school, uh, but there's another definition that's uh, the sensitive receptor definition, uh, which does, uh, it's more encompassing. It does include uh, schools, but it also includes residences, hospitals, uh, and other sensitive land uses. Would that include a park where you have children, you have equipment out there that's utilized by children. I mean, we run many parks in the county of Los Angeles. I'm sure other counties do as well. But uh, most of our children, um, as it is, were park poor, but they utilize, they heavily utilize those parks. And, and many of them do fall in some of the areas that we heard that are heavily contaminated. And Maywood's one of them, South El Monte, um, El Monte. Yeah, sensitive receptor does not include uh, a park. Park? Yeah, it does not. Well, maybe that's something we should consider. We let us consider it. It's, I think the uh, what I, my main concern is if we want to get to September, if we make a substantial change to the rule, uh, we just I would have to just work with legal to see if, if it would be viewed as a, a substantial change that would trigger um, renoticing. Just given the concept of uh, the location, many times school districts utilize the park for activities. So, I mean, legal counsel maybe can look at, you know, the relationship that exists and especially, you know, year-round activities that occur, uh, you know, that happens often. So, I'm, I'm eager to hear what county counsel will report back. Thank you. Our counsel. Our counsel. <laughs> Well, you do serve okay. several counties. <laughs> yeah, we all we all wear a lot of hats. <laughs> all right, I think we've gotten enough comments. Uh, thank you, everyone that came. Um, I think we need to move on to the other five items. There are four items that are on the agenda. Um, Wayne, I'm, uh, Wayne, I'm curious. Uh, I'm looking at my calendar, uh, looking out at uh, next month. I know we're supposed to be dark in August, but I'm curious to find out if, if staff would be willing to come in on August 17th and have a state transfer resource committee meeting then, and if I would have a quorum for the from the board members. So there are uh, challenges with uh, schedules on the 17th. I know uh, myself, at least two others of the senior staff won't be here. I'm trying to look around and see who else is not going to be here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, let me uh, 
Let me take stock of who's here and whether or not we could actually do that and get back to you. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the agenda. We have five or four other items. Uh, do we have a, a, a large group that's here to speak to any of these items or? I do not believe so, Mr. Chairman, and staff's willing to uh, pull two items. So that will reduce the time. Okay. Which items are those? So we would uh, pull item number three and item number five. All right, Tracy, how quickly can we do uh, the rules 2001 and 2002? Yes, sir, I can do it very quickly. Please go um, ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, back in January, we came with one of our first elements of transitioning the reclaim program to a command and control structure and amended the rules to prevent facilities from entering the reclaim, but also facilitate the ability for facilities that no longer have NOx emitting equipment, reclaim source equipment, as we call them, to exit the program. The proposal that we have before you today addresses a couple of elements. One is an opt-out provision that would allow the facilities that we were not able to address back in January, give them the ability to exit the reclaim program. And then also for facilities through the BARC rule development that, uh, that we've identified that we could initiate a, uh, an exit from the program to allow them the ability to stay within reclaim. As a part of that uh, proposal, we would um, allow those facilities to stay in for a limited amount of time. Our proposal right now is until December of 2023 or earlier, depending on if we can address two key main issues. Those two issues are new source review. It's an issue that we have in transitioning from Reclaim NSR to Command and Control NSR into Regulation 13. And the other is this, the form and uh, the contents of the permits to operate. So we're gonna be looking at that. We did release today our 75 day documents. We are going to have a public workshop on August 9th. We'll be able to uh, get public comment. And if necessary, if the committee desires, we will return. Um, we can return in September to provide an update on those uh, provisions um, pending a public hearing in October. So with that, Mr. Chair. Very good. Any board member questions on this item? Uh, yes. So, Dr. Lugo, go ahead. <laughs> quickly, uh, with the new source review, we have come kind of come front and center with SB 288. I would believe, in, in order to most likely, in order to do anything on that, we would have to have legisl state legislation at minimum passed by the legislature and signed by whichever governor. Right? Wait, we are um, not talking about relaxation. Yeah. No, we're not. We're not. What we're trying to do is, where reclaim on NSR is based on actually missions, reclaim or NSR for command and control is based more on potential to emit. So what we're trying to do is make sure we're covered under both those programs to make sure that one, facilities can offset emissions either through ERCs or through our internal bank, and to make sure we, that we do not exceed the CEQA thresholds of uh, Rule 1315. So we're not talking about a relaxation, we're talking about being able to address with US EPA to make sure we are covered, that we do not have any, any relaxations or backtracking. So what exactly are we asking of EPA then? So, so for this particular action, all we're doing is delaying, delaying some facilities who would like to stay within reclaim for the purposes for of- For quote unquote limited time, I, I have yeah. questions on how, what we mean yeah. by limited time, but it appears limited time is based on this whole issue of NSR, so it gets to the question of what are we talking about? What are we asking EPA to do? What can we expect them to do? How do we get out of this mess? How do we avoid having these facilities and reclaim forever, right? Mm -hmm. Understand that? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm asking. Well, what we want to do is we want to continue to work with EPA. We've initiated uh, discussions with them, but the crux of the matter still comes about where in, in reclaim, Facilities were able to emit, it was based on actual emissions where we were looking at potential to emit and really facility level emissions under Regulation 13. And we're trying to make sure that we cover ourselves because in, in Reclaim, for lack of a better description, you do not have an NSR account like you do under Regulation 13. I understand all we're that. Trying to do it. What does EPA have to do so, in order for us to move forward? Yeah. So the, the, the primary issue is that Reclaim NSR has its, Reclaim has its own set of new source review, then Reg 13 and Command and Control. As we exit these facilities into the Command and Control regulatory structure, they need to be able to have offsets if they want to have a new or modified uh, piece of equipment or um, as they move forward. 
the ERC availability in the open market is very scarce. And so before we exit these facilities, we would like the facilities to have uh, the ability to uh, modify and use the offsets if they need them. If they can't find them in the open market, uh, that's a concern. So one thought was that if they could use the uh, offsets for a limited amount of time in the internal bank, uh, that could help to alleviate and we can allow the, the flow of facilities exiting. Uh, EPA has to approve that uh, and has to approve that uh, as we would move forward and to ensure that they're comfortable with the use of those offsets. So if I could also address the question of state law. Please. Uh, so SB 288 um, prohibits the district, all districts in California, from amending their NSR rules to be less stringent than they were <coughs> on December 30th, 2002. So the provision we're talking about here, the offset provision, uh, is one which can be amended as long as on a programmatic basis it remains equivalent to what it was in 2002. It's 288 has some other requirements that have to be maintained at equivalent stringency on a source specific basis, but offsets is not one of them. It has to be equivalent on a programmatic basis. So it's less likely that any of these proposals would require a change in state law. At, at this present point, um, I don't think they're formulated enough to know for sure, but we would have a much greater chance when we're looking at offsets than if we tried to change individual requirements. And similar to that, if I can add, is a fundamental aspect of clean source review is how you go about and calculate an emission increases and emission decreases. And the, our conventional RAC 13 versus our 2005 uh, NSR under reclaim are using two different uh, structures. So we need to establish uh, a mechanism that translates this one program to the other. And there's some legwork to be done uh, to accomplish that. That needs to be factored into a rule language. I think from my perspective, Dr. Liu, we're asking for a hold, if you will, on this whole NSR issue. And EPA has agreed to that. And they've agreed to it in part because the parties are discussing, we're discussing options. And you, you heard uh, from EPA directly on that very matter that they do want to work with us on this issue. So if there's a concern about a deadline or a date um, that you have so that we're not extending forever or whatever the case may be, you know, we can report back on the progress of those NSR um, discussions. I'm concerned about large facilities not controlling their emissions to BART, so, and in part because they've so. remained in reclaim for a very, very long time, but this, no, and have been able to purchase credits in order to, to do so, and so. delays, continual delays in getting them out of reclaim and getting them to BART. Let us address those concerns. I'm trying to get emission reductions. Sure. Understood, as we all are. So with that, Phil. <laughs> Sorry. The plan is to move forward with the BART rules and set BART schedules, and That's they will right. all be subject to that, regardless of whether they are in yeah, reclaim or out of reclaim. The reason a facility might choose to remain in reclaim and have all the reconciliation requirements that they might not want to have, they're putting on BART anyway, mm -hmm. they might want to stay in just until we work out this NSR issue, just to give them some comfort and allow us to move forward with the most important aspect of this whole transition, which is setting BART and letting the facilities know what they need to do in the next two, three, or five years. Yeah, that's important. If they, even if they remain in reclaim and we adopt a BART rule with a they schedule, have they'll have to comply with it. And that's not new. We did that in the electricity and the power crisis. It was all 2009. 2009. No, 2012. Well, it wasn't that straightforward. <laughs> they came out, they went back in. Part of the getting back in was getting, having to do BART. That was different. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, board member comments before we take public comment. Public commenters on this item. Yes. Run on down. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kalil Kochiyama, and I'm a lifelong Torrance resident and UC Santa Barbara student. I'm here today to express my appreciation for the board's progress on updating regulations on NOx emissions with promote, proposed amendments 2001 and 2002 
and with proposed rule 1109.1, .1, which I know will be dis dis discussed in future meetings. I encourage, you to do, I encourage you to continue to do so with the community's health, community's health in mind. Growing up, living with asthma became second nature. As a kid, I figured my experience in the ER from struggling to breathe and knowing how to bring my inhaler everywhere were obstacles every kid had to face. Little did I know that wasn't the case and neither should it be. Just like living with asthma, living next to a refinery all, was also second nature. In high school, our local refinery would run test sirens during my fourth period class on the first Wednesday of each month. At the time, it felt so routine and normal for a student to hit, inhabit a learning environment so close to a refinery. When driving down the street to the refinery border, we were forced to roll up our windows and turn off our vents until we passed, or else the smells would infiltrate the inside of our cars. Unfortunately, teenage bodies don't hold the same luxury of rolling up a window for protection. So I ran track, cross country, went to school, and played basketball, all within a half mile of the refinery and breathing in fumes daily. It's only since I've been studying environmental studies in college at UC Santa Barbara that I learned about the true impacts of the types of pollution and fighting you threaten us with. NOx pollution is known to damage the respiratory tract and the body's immune system, as well as cause air pollution and environmental damage. When exposed to sunlight, NOx is converted to ground level ozone that becomes even more dangerous, especially to those with asthma and other respiratory diseases. The AKMD board, following the direction of the Stationary Source Committee, has authority to ensure refineries implement the best available retrofit control technology and to place stronger regulations that would guarantee the safety of all those susceptible. I would like to thank the members of the committee, staff, and entire AKMD board for your diligence on these matters. I'll continue to follow your progress on Proposed Rule 2001 and 2002 and Proposed Rule 1109.1 .1 as we together can solve these issues that my home in Torrance and neighboring communities have been facing for decades. Growing up plague with unnecessary pollution should be second nature to no one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one more commenter, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Is there anyone else after Mr. Pettit? <clears throat> Thank you, and good morning. Uh, I'm David Pettit from NRDC. I wanted to briefly address the uh, NSR reclaim issue that uh, Dr. Liu had some questions about. Uh, it, in our view, I mean, it's a highly technical issue and one that is of a lot of concern to us because of the potential effects uh, on the ground, as it were, to our clients who live near uh, a lot of the uh, NOx emitting uh, facilities. Um, from our standpoint, I, you know, I told staff this, I think there's a way forward, a way out of this, where we can get together on something that will please the environmental community <clears throat> and staff and uh, EPA. So although uh, I think it's not gonna be easy to get there, I think there is a way uh, to get there so that we can move forward with the process of ending reclaim without uh, getting tied up in uh, stupid and uh, uh, costly litigation over NSR. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we do have someone in Orange County that would like to speak. Oh my gosh. Okay. I wouldn't uh, take that now. Uh, yeah, let's uh, just hopefully we can pull this off technologically, but uh, we'll we'll try it. And if you can't hear, just shout. Good morning. This is Frances Keeler with Clyde & Co. Um, as Mr. Goss stated earlier, the package was just released today. Um, we have not had the ability to actually look at any rule language. Um, so it is difficult for us to give any kind of input on the specific proposal of the staff. And we would like to have the time to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <laughs> staff have a response to that as far as the timing or when we'll That's be hearing this again? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, we did release the 75-day document today. Uh, we do have a comment period associated with our workshop that will allow uh, comments and be able to address those comments. Uh, we asked for comments to be received by August 23rd, and that, those comments will be responded to and included in staff's uh, considerations. So, um, because we're dark in August, what happens is we typically would present to the Station Resource Committee two months before the hearing, but we, we're coming three months a little earlier, and so it's a little bit awkward because it's the uh, same time frame that we're releasing our mm -hmm. preliminary rule language. Um, so we can come back uh, to stationary if that's the desire uh, the month before, and that way the stakeholders will have the opportunity to have digested the proposed medical. Uh, I think we should do that, have it come yeah, back here. That makes sense. Yeah. So that, that would but, be the similar situation yep. for 1135, which is also an October hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Right. And if not, Francis, you have my number. <laughs> All right. She, said she posted yeah. it on the internet with instructions. <laughs> to <her. laughs> Perfect. All right, any other questions on this item? If not, uh, Wayne, uh, item number four, I don't see how we have enough time to go through that right now. Is there time to do that between now and when it comes back to the board? Um, I think we're going to have to. Can we do it in September? It'll be after the set hearing in September. Yeah, the I think we're going to have to get back to you on a meeting next month, Mr. Chairman. Okay, just a quick poll of my board members. Uh, would there be enough of us to be here on the 17th? Yes. I've got at least three yeses there so far. So we'll have the board members. So staff, if you can get back to us, if we could do that, I think that'd be the appropriate maneuver at this point. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and postpone item number four, and then also three and five. Would, would they need to come back at that time, Wayne? Sure. Yes. Okay. All right, we have a written report that are attached. Any questions on those from our board members or, or any comments on those items? None. No. Any other business no. uh, by our board members? None. How about general public comment? No one got up. Mr. Not Chairman. Anybody. Oh, staff can yes. come to the 17th. Oh, okay. Okay. And then with that, our next meeting date will be uh, August 17th, not September 12th or 21st, sorry. And uh, unfortunately, we'll have to pull that or have that meeting, but uh, I think it's uh, well worth our time. Otherwise, technology wouldn't start until probably 1 o'clock. So thank you all, and we'll go ahead and do that then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.